if. Our development bylaws created places where we have a choice about how we're going to get around. Walkable, character-rich places where kids have some autonomy and elders some dignity. North Americans spend more hours in their cars than anyone else on Earth. And a big part of that is because of our laws that separate where we live from where we work, learn, and shop, and insist on big, fast roads connecting them all. I'd like to tell you a story about my son's treasure tree. It's a tree at the end of our street. Roman is seven years old, and he's allowed to walk to the treasure tree all by himself. Because there are garages out back and eyes on the street. It's a narrow, yield street, so the cars go slowly. There's a hollow in this tree, and the people who live there stock it with treasures. Matchbox cars, decorated pencils, and on this particularly lucky day, a Snoopy stuffy. If I could get you to humor me for a moment and close your eyes, think back to a place that your favorite place that you like to go by yourself when you were seven years old without grown-ups. Would you let your kids go to any place on your street by themselves today? If you would, please raise your hand. Look around you. What does that tell you? Did you play street hockey when you were a kid? Do you let your kids play? This was my first game of street hockey I ever experienced because I'm originally from Alabama and we don't play street hockey in Alabama. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous. I hung out on the curb and pretended to videotape my son and his friends. Then I started noticing a few things. There are 12 kids on our one block, and whenever there was a car, the older kids vigilantly got everybody else onto the grass. That was made possible in part because the streets were narrow and slowed down the cars, so they had time to see them coming. Front gardens and front porches ensure that several parents are usually close by. The garages out back further slow down the car activity and keep them heading mostly forward. The street trees here make for a sense of enclosure and calm the traffic even more, but nobody seems to mind because it's a really fun place to be. Kids on our street have all sorts of gathering places, and this degree of socialization makes for co-parenting. Autonomy is fostered in large part by the form of the built environment, by the character of the neighborhood. And many of the details that make the walkable neighborhoods so healthy for our kids, grown-ups, and our elders are actually illegal today. And as a result, our society, economy, and environment have been getting sick. So what is so illegal about my neighborhood of Crescentwood? Well, the other day while I was walking my errands, I documented a few things. These are the key things that are illegal to build as a matter of right in new neighborhoods today or when we redevelop our older neighborhoods. The average North American is willing to walk five minutes to their destination or 10 minutes in a transit-oriented development. This five-minute walk is what defines a neighborhood or the unit of sustainable development. This is my particular neighborhood. That green pen is my house, and the two blue lines end on Cordon Avenue and Stafford, two great places to walk within five minutes. Highly valued places contain most, or many at least, of our daily needs within this five-minute walk. So come with me, let's take a look at my neighborhood and why people value the older neighborhoods in Winnipeg so highly. This particular day, it was minus, uh, well, okay, well below zero, but walkable urbanism mitigates the most extreme environments with interesting places to stop. Most of our streets today are wide and fast. They're all about moving cars quickly instead of safely coexisting with pedestrians. 
However, this is very unsafe, and North Americans have the highest traffic fatality rate than any other combination of developed nations. We die in our cars, and because of our cars, a lot. Narrow streets like this yield street slows down the traffic. And once the grid is added back into the urban structure, cars have a lot of different options about how they want to disperse in the case of congestion. Many more options than you have in cul-de-sacs, collectors, and arterials that have very few connections between them. Complete streets realize that instead of just those few options for street types, we need a big palette of streets because they change their character as they move through the rural to urban transect. Just like you'd change what you're wearing if you're on a farm versus downtown. Complete streets let us walk to our daily needs, whether it's the corner store or services or restaurant shops and offices. Complete streets also encourage aging in place, or as my generation prefers to say, gray, graying in place, because we're not really ready to talk about aging quite yet. In addition, walkability is more than just about having a safe and attractive place to walk. It's also about having destinations, whether it's Roman's treasure tree or these retail corridors. Rear lanes handle services and cars with rear-facing garages, leaving the fronts of the building to be more human scale and inviting. We're more interested in other human beings than we are in anything else. Unless something changes, my son's generation is slated to be the first generation to live less long than his parents in the history of the world unless we have some big scientific breakthrough that cures the side effect of obesity. And I realize there is a wide range of societal changes that are contributing to this statistic. However, a big fact that, that contributes perhaps the most highly of all is that the last child has left the woods, or pretty close to it, and the obesity that goes with that sort of sedentary lifestyle. Neighborhood scale schools allow children to safely walk and bike to school. However, many of our laws on this continent outlaw them with school size minimums that create regionally scaled schools to which no one can safely bike or walk. Canada does a little bit better than the US in this regard. However, on our outskirts, we still have regional schools and fitness facilities to which everyone must drive unless you're a very brave biker. Vertical mixed use creates some interesting places along with calming the traffic and reducing the parking requirements. In more urban areas, build two lines instead of setbacks create an exterior room, a sense of enclosure. When we say mixed use, we often think this vertical mixed use, but horizontal mixed use is incredibly important too, especially at this, shall we say, frugal point in our economic cycle. Re-allowing in-home occupations uh, invigorate the knowledge economy and help it to thrive. Allowing B&Bs and granny flats out back help us to monetize the millions of empty bedrooms that we currently have on this continent and our extra square footage. And just because we allow mixed use doesn't mean I'm going to be next door to the corner store. It does mean that we're allowing some in-home occupations and enabling interesting destinations to which I can walk in five minutes. This apartment building exists just fine with its single-family detached houses that surround it. Everyone loves this building. However, most of our laws require segregation of housing types by single-family and multi-family, but also by square footage. So on our 65th birthday, we wake up to this very uncomfortable fact that there's no place in our neighborhood we can move to if we want to downsize, because there's nothing of a smaller footprint in newer neighborhoods. So, what wasn't legal about my neighborhood again? Narrow, complete streets, mixed use, build two lines instead of setbacks, neighborhood scale civic, a variety of housing, and rear lanes. So, who's doing anything differently and what tools are they using? People are starting to use form based bylaws or form based codes that fo focus fir first on form and then secondly on use. 
The buildings shape the public realm instead of relying on numbers that we always fight about, like density, that we can't visualize very well, that don't really speak to us of character. The street network is added back in, uh, and walking becomes the basic unit of urban design. Character-based zones replace use-based zones. And instead of these wide, fast roads that connect all these separated uses and have this sort of sense of placelessness, this home from nowhere sort of feeling that you get when you visit one of these places, form-based codes extract the DNA of the most loved places, of the highest performing urbanism, and re-allows that DNA to happen as a matter of right. So this place, after it adopted a form-based code, starts to become recognizable because the, the buildings get closer to the street. The streets go on a diet and the lanes get skinny, allowing for biking lanes and, and on-street parking to be added, making it a lot safer to be a pedestrian here. A sense of enclosure starts to happen when the vertical mixed use and horizontal mixed use uh, is added back in, and the neighborhood unit of a variety of housing types, transportation choices, and neighborhood scale civic make for a real place. This place becomes recognizable for who it really is, Taos, New Mexico. You can start seeing it becoming itself again. Eight years ago, I started the code study that's now co-authored with Professor Emily Tallon. We look at places that have adopted form-based codes around the world. Currently, there are 30, 386 cities and towns who have adopted these sorts of character-based ordinances to govern how their places are going to be built. That's only 1% of the global cities and towns. But, and nine of those are in Alberta, three are in BC, two in Ontario, and as of yet, none in Manitoba. Around the world, form-based codes are in the works for 47 million people, covering 54 million acres. Big city leaders on North America include Calgary, Portland, Denver, Dallas, Memphis, Tulsa, Nashville, Buffalo, Baltimore, and Miami. While form-based codes celebrated their 30th birthday last year, 80% of them have happened in the last eight years. I've kind of skewed this little graph uh, to make a point, and that is these are the adopted codes for the last 30 years and the ones that are currently in process right now. They won't all get adopted in 2011, but you can start to see that perhaps we're at a tipping point. So who, what, do we, what benefits are these places reaping? The one that's easiest to quantify is the money, as, as it often is with respect to urbanism. Places that have five-story mixed use are generally paying the city coffers about 25 times more dollars per acre than big box. Here's a study from Woodstock, Georgia, that looks at different forms of the built environment in that city and starts to look at what they're each paying back on a per acre basis. Keep those four colors in mind because they're the first four colors on this graph, which um, also add back in their form-based code, which they adopted a few years ago, and that five-story mixed use blows everything else out of the water at 200, over $200,000 per acre per year that it pays back to the city. And that's before you take into account the 32 to 47 percent less expensive the, that infrastructure is to build to, in a compact way instead of in a sprawling manner. The downtown area is 39 times more revenue per acre than the Super Walmart and four times more jobs per acre. The part of town that's working out the best for city coffers is also working out the best for family wallets and for the environment. It's the orange part of this graph that's governed by their form-based code, this chart. Uh, and it's, it's much less transportation costs per month and it's le much less carbon dioxide admitted per household per month. So I'm not saying no to big boxes. They've become part of, of our, our uh, retail environment, but when they perform, when they behave in an urban manner like this Target in Minneapolis, they're great. But if we're going to let them behave in autocentric manners, we just need to be aware of how much we're paying to have them roll into town. 
So back to my story, the, the confessions of a former sprawl addict. My family moved to Winnipeg three and a half years ago uh, from Florida. This is our house, and walkscore.com says that it scores only a six out of a hundred. It's completely auto-dependent. My husband sold it to me as an experiment uh, to, to quantify my sort of work. In, in truth, the more walkable areas were very expensive there. This house has all sorts of uh, private amenities, but from a public perspective, there was no amenity that I could walk to in five minutes. Moving to the exchange district, where we lived for two and a half years, you can't even see our house on this picture because it's covered with interesting places to walk to. It scores 100, or a walker's paradise. And until our son grew out of the, the school in our neighborhood, it was an amazing place to raise a child. Once again, another TED Talk. So our family went from a three-car family driving 500 miles on average every month to a one-car family averaging 50 miles every month. We saved all sorts of dollars and, and percentages of emissions, 90% less carbon footprint from, a, from our transportation cost. Uh, lots of car savings, lots of pound savings, but really what we got most of all was real community, which you can't really put a price tag on. It's true that any city or town on North America that's, re that's adopted a comprehensive plan in the last five years enables all the sorts of policies that I'm talking about today, the neighborhood centers, the town centers, the walkability, the transit choice, the housing types, all of those things are allowed and encouraged in policy, but they're not encouraged in our laws quite yet. What if we created bylaws that allowed us to build places as good or better as the places that we've built in the past, like Montreal in the 40s, what if we allowed places to be built where, that encouraged and enabled active transportation that could potentially turn around our children's life expectancy by enabling them to, to walk around? What if?